And next, we welcome Laura J. Roberton, Practice Lead and Head of Process Automation at First Derivatives. And Laura will be talking about citizen development. So I'm really interested in this one, actually. Um, welcome, Laura. Hopefully you're there. I am, yes, yes. Hi. Excellent. Thanks, thanks for joining us, Look, That's brilliant. So um, we're hopefully going to uh, see your slide shortly. Let's see if I've got the right See if I've got the right um, screen up there. Have you got your uh, slides ready to share, Laura? Yeah, I was just flipping it to the right page. Can Fabulous. you see that? Yeah, that's perfect. Brilliant. If you could just make that sort of full screen, oh, that would cool. be brilliant. There we and go. we're pretty much done. Brilliant. Thank you. So over to you. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you. All right. So I am going to be talking today. I'll just turn my uh, webcam on just very briefly so you can see that I'm an actual person. <laughs> I'm going to be giving a bit of an overview of citizen development and uh, if it's really for the people and uh, hopefully not a too heavy session. I'm, I'm aware of the fact certainly in the UK, the pubs reopened yesterday. So there may be some people on this session with, with a bit of a hangover. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be talking about citizen development, how we deployed it at First Derivatives for, for one of our clients um, and looking at uh, a particular case study, how we set up the metrics and the KPIs to measure its success. I'm going to give you a very brief overview of First Derivatives and the most important thing, our understanding of yourselves and, and how you may, may be looking to deploy and use citizen development. I'll be citing some best practice from the PMI, the Project Management Institute, who've recently published a course in citizen development that I'm also certified in. Uh, so coming on to uh, whether, uh, sorry, coming on to who we are at First Derivatives. So I'm practice lead for, for process automation. First Derivatives are a public limited company based in Northern Ireland. And we provide in the capital markets consulting, we provide consultancy predominantly in the capital markets area. And I have three streams in my practice, which revolve around service offerings for RPA, process mining and citizen development. So we're very much getting towards that 50% of the intelligent automation suite in my particular area. And then we have other streams within the first derivatives consulting practice that, that look to plug that gap further. We've developed this citizen developer offering based on the fact that first derivatives have been using this technology for a number of years now. And we also have large teams of business analysts who, when they go into clients, they're, they're often considered to be one of the team and, and they very much have that core technical domain and financial expertise that allows them to do that. So coming on to the, the most important thing, and that is uh, who you are. So we have, oh, we have, uh, apologies. We have put together uh, the, the kind of people that we think are attending this event uh, based on the roles that you have. And we've looked at CXOs in your buyer roles right down to some of the potential users of citizen development and, and what it may, may mean to you. Um, looking to use this as, as part of your day to day. Some of the previous concerns we heard were around the fact that in the reconciliations area, which is the use case I'm going to be talking about, there were many disparate tools being used. And we're here to tell you as, as business leads, you don't have to waste your time in overly complex reconciliation tools. And especially if you take a citizen developer approach, and there could be others in here that are hearing this word developers and thinking, oh gosh, my people are definitely not developers. Um, and in some instances we agree because it, it's about it's about what we call three A's. So it's not only about whether your employees have the appetite, but it's also whether they have the right attitude and, and the right aptitude to be able to use some of these tools. Um, so finally, also as CXOs, you may be frustrated with the fact maybe you're running certain processes and you're using many, many tools. And with 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 the scope of citizen developer applications now, that they've come on a long way since we first started using them. And you can move much more rapidly away from point to point solutions and just use one tool to perform a reconciliation process. As an example, we we have one of our investment banking clients. They've been able to automate 900 processes using the tool that I'm going to be talking about. So 
coming on to what all the hype is about uh, appreciate this is a, this is a, a bit of a busy slide um, but the, the I'm going to focus on the two key areas in, in within my remit which is RPA and, and citizen development so this curve measures client expectations on the left against timelines and it's really looking at um, helps organizations assess whether they're behind or ahead of the curve against industry standards in, in their adoption of technology and we can see RPA and citizen development. Citizen development here is, is slightly further on in, in terms of getting towards that slope of enlightenment and having been, been used quite actively for a number of years now. In Gartner and, and some of the RPA vendors will say otherwise, but you do need to have, in our experience and practice, you do need to have some technical nous to be able to code using RPA. That's not quite the same in, in citizen development. And, and this is why clients are have become more and more interested in it. Um, you know, you also have the fact that you often, to get the best return investment, you often have to do a large re-engineering piece up front for RPA. It's not the case with citizen development. You can use tools that are called low code or no code uh, where no specific SQL skills are required. And, and the most important thing, you don't need developers to roll it out. Um, but you also need to ensure that these kind of tool sets don't move into what we call shadow IT. And, and I'll come on to our definition of that shortly. But that's the whole purpose of, of citizen development as well. It's one of the key purposes. So we've got a practical example of how we deployed it, how we went about building out the relevant KPIs. But first of all, I'm, I'm going to touch on the what and the why of citizen development. You may be sitting there scratching your head thinking, what on earth is she talking about? So I'll move on to some general stats now. So it really gained prevalence due to the proliferation that we've had in organizations of, of shadow IT. It was a, a term that was coined back in 2014, and it's promoted as a way to reduce the reliance on shadow IT. Shadow IT for us, it's anything that can't be monitored or managed with full transparency via IT. And we now have a 20 billion market for no-code applications. In order that you can use it correctly and properly scale and go from a discovery phase into it being adopted and scaling within the organization, you do need to have um, you do need to have the right roles in place, but you also need to do uh, an IT inventory to really understand the size of the prize and, and exactly what kind of problem you may be dealing with. And the, the other key thing is you need adopted in the organization. And I'll, I'll come back to this strategic point later and in the concluding comments, as in just how strategic can you be using it? Um, but in essence, there's a role for, for everybody to play here. So just coming on to the actual tools that are in use in the market. So we have ServiceNow. They recently published a, a couple of citizen developer offerings. And also they've recently acquired IntelliBot, which is, which is an RPA vendor. So here, again, ServiceNow themselves as an organization and many organizations now are thinking in terms of this intelligent automation mindset. And when I say intelligent automation, that doesn't just mean RPA standalone. It means how you couple it with process mining, citizen development and other uh, offerings as well to really supercharge what you can do with RPA. And then on the bottom here, these are our citizen developer tools that we've been using actively at clients for, for a number of years now. So we have Acceptor that I'm going to be talking about, and there is Alteryx as well. But I'm sure many of you in, in this call are having a, a real, a wry smile about this viability of the citizen developer approach. And the, the word developer is, perhaps sparking some concerns. I'm wondering how many of you feel that it's a threat or how many of you are confident that the business uh, will need you and, and your skills a good while longer? Well, that's definitely um, our experience. You know, it's not a question of lobbing this over, uh, a tool over to the business and, and expecting them to get on with it. It's very much, it enforces a collaboration very early on. It's not a one size fits all approach. So we were involved very early days in a capital markets experimentation with Acceptor. They were founded in 2003 and we trialled the use of their tool at a large Canadian bank in 2016. Um, why did we do this and what did we find? 
Well, getting to the why of citizen development, it's it's very much uh, the fact, particularly in, in financial services and, and many older institutions as well, you have rigid systems, they often don't respond to business needs. Um, and that's how these tools have really gained prevalence. It's due to the need for speed. There's often a shortage of IT talent and budget. Um, and the tools were really defined as much as possible to put power back into business users' hands and, and used correctly. As I said, they can be part of a wider digital transformation strategy. I've got a few more points on here. Businesses stood up and torn down in a matter of months rather than years. Waiting for a large technology rollout, not just ERP now, any rollout. Um, you know, this statistic of 70% end up in failure, this has been a, quite a consistent stat for a number of, of decades now. So this, this may be the reason many CXOs are now, uh, you know, more and more interested in, in what can we do now that has quite a tangible difference. And then particularly during the pandemic, the appetite and interest it exploded. There's a need for smaller, more agile teams to be working together a lot more seamlessly than they did previously. And then in capital markets in, in particular, in fact, I'm pretty sure this is industry agnostic, using Excel as, as ERP. You know, the proliferation of Excel in many organisations is astonishing. I was, I was on an RPA implementation where we didn't have the traceability, we didn't have the documentation as to why and how a macro had been built the way it had. And, and that's a, a key risk for, for businesses and organisations today. In the UK, if we look back in, in recent history at the COVID crisis, we only have to look at that uh, and remember the fact that due to an Excel formula error, 16,000 COVID cases were, they were, they were missing and, and that was blamed on the Excel formulas. So back to the banks, a lot of their systems are also decades old, problematic to expose APIs on often. And when you're thinking about the benefits of this, we have been working with a client for a couple of years now on a large RPA implementation, and, and they were able through the implementation of RPA this time to cost avoid a spend of between three and five million through the user, through implementing RPA. So it's it's not this technology. It's not always about pure cost save. It's it's cost avoidance. It's it's the potential for for other revenue streams as well. So um, the way that um, banks are now, we we need to have that, uh, particularly around the regulatory reporting requirements that are needed. There needs to be that flexibility to log and track track comments. Uh, as to why something has been booked the way it is in, in something a bit more stable than, than Excel. So Accept offers multiple file type support, it gives you visibility of data enrichments without hidden code, and most importantly, there's no need for a developer to build the reconciliation. We had our team of business analysts build it. They were pure play BAs with some knowledge of, of SQL. And also using it, the Acceptor logic changes could be made and stood up quite quickly in a test environment by the BAs themselves. So this obviously allows those change management timelines to reduce quite significantly as well. So this is, yes, this is really saying, this is what has led, all of these points have led to the rise in citizen development and, and the, um, the ability to reduce the, this reliance on shadow IT quite significantly. So, here is the actual acceptor case study, the challenges we have, the solution and the benefits. So at, at a high level, first of all, in order to provide the regulators with more transparency, the business users in this scenario, they were using some auditable tools, so they weren't in shadow IT, but they were just not intuitive. They had non-friendly UIs. And the, one of the reconciliation tools in use in 2016, it was it was really sophisticated code. It didn't make sense to the business. So the very transparency it was meant to be providing was just indecipherable. And, and it was these business and, and operational people that needed to be able to explain it to the regulators. And then if the consultants or developers left, there was no requirements traceability. The acceptor tool itself, that provides within the tool an automated documentation page, a little bit like a business requirements document. So instead of coming back to the project in six months, knowing not knowing how it was built, you can actually review the changing requirements more dynamically. And also there, a developer was always required to build the rec, which took a number of days. We actually brought that timeline down to a number of hours. And then finally, 
we all know the risks of the non-adoption of technology, or, or we should know the risks of it. And that is the fact that users uh, will go back to their old ways of working. In, in this particular scenario, that, that, that tool was just too complex for them to understand. So they would have, there was the risk, they would have gone back to good old Excel. So th there were many challenges we had to face in this scenario. I've, um, I'll just highlight three. One of them was the fact cross-departmental reconciliations were taking a lot of time. There was audit gaps because of using Excel and adapting to regulatory changes was just not dynamic enough for that organisation. So the solution was for us to build with our team of business analysts, what could be done and built and maintained by the business analysts themselves. So we built what we call a, a no restriction reconciliation. The BA set up parts of the identity and access management. A developer was required for the back end configuration. And the BA's also packaged up what went into production via GitHub. Uh, here also timeouts were managed by a developer. So you can see already, it's not a question of lobbing a, a project a product over the wall to the business and expecting them to get on with it. And that's, that's not the point also, because you, you're looking as one of the key metrics to reduce shadow IT. Um, on the benefit side of things, they were multifold. The, these are just highlights. We reduced the reconciliation build and go live down from 140 hours to 72. There was a reduction, significant reduction in license cost and that, that largest, that most complex reconciliation tool was completely decommissioned. And then on the softer side of things, employee engagement, uh, that it was a simple and easy to use tool for the business. So is it just about empowering employees or is it something more? Well, we've understood the what and the why. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got building the, the maturity model and the resources and, and also considerations of, of what needs to go into a business case. We know that it added significant value in our scenario, but in the words of Jerry Maguire, show me the money. How do you really um, tangibly measure that? Well, this is an extract from the PMI here, and, and they suggest five key metrics to measure the success of a citizen developer initiative. And those metrics are effective resource allocation, number two, benefits realization, as people sufficiently trained and skilled, does it promote collaboration? And finally, does it reduce shadow IT? So we've put our own metrics and measurements on, on top of this because this, this is really uh, quite high level as well. So we measured the effective resource allocation through capacity metrics. We were able to show we brought the tooling timelines down from 20 days to nine days. Uh, we had the benefits realised that I've, I've already mentioned, tooling decommissioning, uh, employee engagement, uh, efficiency saves, but we also had uh, reduced key man dependency and also obvious regulatory benefits through the visibility of any erroneous trades or reporting on um, exceptions and the fact that they were being dealt with in a timely manner. Um, and that all plays into cost avoidance as well and, and um, yeah, reduction or uh, eradication of re regulatory fines. Finally, promoting cross-department collaboration. This organisation was able to take it from the discovery to experimentation to scaling to adoption and then to scaling as well this tool moved outside of pure capital markets went into the wealth management area so that's that's a key scenario where it did quite quickly promote that collaboration and and obvious employee engagement and then finally reduction in shadow it yes we had that we had less excel usage and we we're able to decommission some really highly complex non-business user-friendly tools. So coming on to uh, how you manage all of this start to end and, and some of the roles that are required for that. And, and this is a maturity model that I've been talking about. So you do need IT uh, integration. You do need roles of practitioners, architects and strategists. I'm just going to talk briefly about just how strategic we think you can get using it in, in my concluding comments. But if you are looking for tools that adopt that agile mantra of turning that hierarchical pyramid on its head and, and putting your employees at the top, then citizen development might be the tool for you. So in brief, then the three roles practitioner, these are citizen developers. 
who need to be given the freedom and authority to act, their end users working with simple automation tools, manipulating UIs, self-building templates, they are not developers. Then the next stage, you're looking at your architects, your semi-professional developers, external advisory, they're performing high-level modeling, complex use cases, potentially exposing APIs, and integrating non-scheduling tools with, with other applications. In our case, it was Control M. And then finally, the role that I call your hardcore developers, so your developers, enterprise architects, system integrators, really looking at building custom code. And I've, I've very much got a question mark around the strategist role here. And, and in their manual, the PMI also talk about the fact they are searching for organizations that have been really able to do this from that strategic standpoint. So to conclude then, as organizations have become more confident in digital offerings, citizen development is very much on that slope of enlightenment. Your destiny is definitely in your hands now. Um, but much like Microsoft didn't, uh, didn't create a, a lot new over, over the years, but copied a lot in industry, citizen development, we don't feel it's a tool that can be used for mass innovation. We, we have doubts you can bring anything particularly new to your industry through it, to your own organization or your bank maybe, but that's not true innovation in its truest con concept. So the PMI mentioned this role of strategists, but we also, we don't see that's the purpose of it. It's almost like there's a need now of past the hype just to celebrate what a functional tool it is. It's not particularly innovative, it's not sexy like machine learning algorithms or big data, but it is, and it's not a tool for mass innovation across industries, but it is a tool that works. And, and often business operational leads that we speak to, they, they often don't need a tool of mass innovation. They're looking to put the human back in the loop or what I mean by that is really train their employees for the digital future, help them to become more agile. So they don't need that tool of mass innovation, but they do need tools of mass usability. And in our experience through using it, that organizations are able to transition from that slope of enlightenment and really reach that product, plateau of productivity through using it a lot more quickly. Brilliant, thank you. That's um, really, really interesting stuff there, actually. We, we've got a, a few minutes um, before, we, before we need to move on. So if anybody wants to ask a question, because that was quite an awful lot of stuff there. If anybody's got a question to ask, please, <laughs> please do so. Uh, that, that was great. I mean, I, I love the premise around it. Um, and, and certainly when, when you're reading about the changes in, uh, in cultures and the fabric of organizations and things like, you know, Gartner talking about the intelligent composable business, about uh, the, the speed, the, the brittleness that we've created in, in organizations, the, the inability to be flexible, no plasticity, and also, you know, platforms um, or, or, or democratizing the decision making and composition in an organization. I mean, that's pretty much it. You're giving the power to the people, you know? And I think there's a, there is a brilliant quote, which is something like, um, give the power to the people to, uh, to remediate the work of fools. I think that was why, <laughs> by, um, yeah, it's really good. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll find it, I'll pass it on to you. It's really, really, really good. And, and I sort of picked that up about a year or so ago. It's by, I can't remember the lady singer um, from 70s, sort of punk ethic, can't remember her name, um, but I'll send it on to you because that to me said, honestly, I know it's a bit weird, right? But that to me sort of was a, a sort of, that's what it is, you know, giving the power back to people, taking away structures, taking away silos, taking away this top down, you mentioned it, the wrong way around stuff and thinking differently, putting humanity back into stuff. Anyway, that's my soapbox for a couple of seconds. Um, let's just maybe cover process mining and, and what that means to intelligent um, automation. You mentioned it a few times there, and that might be a relatively new thing for people, because when we look at IT, especially in ITSM, we talk about uh, continual improvement, but the, the, the sort of, uh, the, the sort of mindset of process mining, what it means to automation and intelligent automation, how that sort of goes from one thing to another. Maybe maybe if you could explain that. Yeah, I, I think there comes a point where organisations have to make a decision. Do they want a large team of BAs doing process analysis for a number of months, which is typically what you need if you need to automate 10 to 20 processes, or do they want to use uh, tools, technology tools that are uh, a bit more scientific because you can bolt, you can either have actual um, process mining or actual task mining as well. Uh, one of them you can just deploy on a desktop and it, it will log activities for a couple of weeks. 
and some of these tools will come out with KPI metrics at the end. Some of them now even produce process definition documents. Or you've got the larger ERP tools that bolt onto things like SAP. And again, they're looking to track and measure bottlenecks in a process and timelines. Because often when, when you're speaking to businesses as well, they will have a good view of, of what works and what doesn't. And you'll, you'll spend some time putting together a happy path and then a, a not so happy path. But actually, once you start to use this from a more scientific technology standpoint, you, you really see immediately lots and lots of different happy path, paths and, and what's really going on in that process and, and where the large velocity bottlenecks are. Um, and that really helps then much more scientifically define a, a potential pipeline for automation as well. Yeah, excellent. That's really, really cool. And, and it will be a slightly different way of thinking for many people. We've talked about that right the way through this, about you know people thinking differently about service composition. And um, we also talked, and you may have missed it earlier, that 60% of the listeners today, 60% in organizations haven't yet even considered, don't know where to start on automation. So there's still an awful oh. lot to do. Yeah, believe it or not, 60%. Exciting. Really, really, yeah, yeah. crazy. I've got, I've got that quote. It's um, it's from a song, Let the People Have the Power to Redeem the Work of Fools. It's by Patty Smith. And I sort of uh, saw that. Yeah. And I sort of saw that as, do you know what? That's a call to arms, man. When you talk about IT and IT service management and what it really means. But that was me being sort of one of my weirder days, to be honest, Laura. But anyway. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed for that. That was, that was really cool to watch. Thank you very much. And hopefully we'll get a chance to do it again sometime. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks okay. So. Thank you. We're going to move on. We're going to um, next welcome Patrick Bolger, Chief Evangelist at Hornbill, and Pat will be talking about